In that context, he, stretches, he stresses um, characteristics that must remain distinctive of Catholic charitable activity by the church. And I found interesting five characteristics he names to be consistent with my own 30-year experience with Catholic charities in this country. And these five are, one, that charity is an immediate response to people's need. Two, the importance of professional competence and training. Three, a heartfelt concern for those in need, including what he calls a formation of the heart to see where love is needed and to act on what you see. Fourth, a refusal to proselytize those who are hungry and poor, forcing faith as a price of care and concern. But fifth, an openness to speak of God balanced with a sense, the Pope writes, of when it is better to say nothing and let love speak. Two years later, in 2007, the Pope wrote a second encyclical letter on hope and its importance in contemporary world. It's a very important letter, but I'm not going to address it. It doesn't fit our topic today. Then two months ago, in July, Pope Benedict released his third encyclical letter entitled Caritas in Veritate, or in English, Charity in Truth. In a sense, this encyclical implements the stance that he had explained in his first encyclical about the church in the public square. Because now, as church in the public square, he takes on the issue, the very important worldwide issue, of human development. First, he writes to influence civic society um, by, one, teaching Catholics about their role, and two, trying to persuade other people of goodwill of the importance of his vision for human development. His style, consistent with being a professional theologian and theology professor, is highly theological. It is a very dense work. And he uses primarily a natural law approach as distinct from a more scriptural approach that's been used in other encyclicals, uh, especially by other popes. And he relies heavily on certain key concepts, love, truth, vocation, gratuitousness, and his phrase, really the core of the, of the, of the letter, integral human development. In, in this encyclical, his third, he consistently affirms many major themes drawn from what we call modern Catholic social teaching, which began in the heat of the Industrial Revolution in 1891 with an encyclical entitled Rerum Novarum, of new things. And I want to discuss the new encyclical, though, in two parts, lots of points. In the first part, I want to talk about four sets of principles that are critical to Catholic thinking and to our stance in the public square when we talk about social and economic development. And secondly, I want to talk about four lines of social analysis and theological reflection that have been common but developing more and more across the last century. In talking about these, um, I'm going to reflect the fact that, that the Pope has many continuities with what's gone before in terms of principles and analysis and reflection. But as with every Pope, there are different nuances in message and content and tone. Most of the newness in this encyclical letter are captured in the broad inclusiveness with which Pope Benedict defines human development. Uh, and so he will cover in this encyclical letter such diverse issues as bioethics, culture, the environment, hunger, migration, spirituality, and technology. First, I want to talk about four major areas of principle in the letter. The first is, and this is very common to the tradition, that the center of all of our teaching is on the human person considered to be both sacred and social. And so he follows Pope Paul VI uh, by emphasizing the, the openness of every individual in the world to transcendence that begins in his discussion with a discussion of the vocation and capacity to love, which makes us like God and ending with his insistence that in integral human development in the world today, we must include the spiritual and moral development of people. And these are parts of our tradition about the sacredness of the human person. It begins, if you know the book of Genesis, all of us who are people of the book, with the fact that the human person is created in God's image and likeness. But the Pope also stresses the essentially social nature of the human person which is very much in tension with American individualism, when he discusses common good, solidarity, human rights, and duties to the larger society, 
interpersonal relationships, and the unity of one human family. So that's the first principle. The second area of principle is the connection between justice and charity. He discusses these in a number of ways in his letter. Early in the letter, he emphasizes that justice is one of the two critical criteria by which the principle of caritas and veritate, charity and truth, governs moral action in the commitment to human development in the world today. As the letter unfolds, though, he discusses the interplay of justice and charity in at least six ways. First, that charity goes beyond justice. Second, that justice requires giving to the other person what is his own prior to giving anything which is mine, which is charity. Third, that justice and charity are inseparable. Fourth, that justice is a way of charity and is its minimum measure. Fifth, that charity demands justice. And sixth, that charity then transcends justice and completes it. What stands out all through Benedict's letter is, of course, his heavy emphasis upon caritas, upon love, which was the theme of his, his first encyclical. And he describes caritas, love, as a force for engagement in the field of justice and peace, which has its origin in God. And Benedict writes that this God has a plan for each human person which each of us, in which each of us finds our own truth and the freedom that comes from adherence to that truth or that plan for ourselves. And so for him, charity and truth are the vocation of every human person and a vocation planted in the hearts and minds of all peoples. The third principle, common, the common good. Before I get into Benedict's discussion, again, very briefly, I want to just take you back to the definition of the common good from the recently revised Catechism of the Catholic Church. Two, sen two sentences from that. First, according to its primary and broadly accepted sense, the common good indicates the sum total of social conditions which allow people either as groups or as individuals to reach their fulfillment more fully and more easily. Second sentence, belonging to everyone and to each one, it is and remains common because it is indivisible and because only together is it possible to attain it, to increase it, and to safeguard its effectiveness with regard also to the future. And Benedict then in, his, in this encyclical emphasizes the common good as the second key criteria with justice that must be applied to integral human development in the world today. And he says that, that it is a requirement, common good is a requirement of justice and charity. He goes on to argue that in this globalized world, the duty to seek the common good now extends beyond my city and even my country to the whole human family. And the common good he invokes all through the letter as a duty of individuals, managers, institutions, and governments and as a measure of the justice of the marketplace and of the economy. Fourth area of principle, subsidiarity and solidarity. Increasingly in recent decades, Catholic social teaching has linked two traditional principles to one another. Subsidiarity, the older principle, and solidarity, the newer one. Benedict discusses first subsidiarity, which is drawn actually from a 1931 encyclical entitled Quadragesimo Anno. And what subsidiarity emphasizes is the importance of making decisions as locally or on a personal level in keeping with human dignity. That if people can make uh, decisions for themselves, the family doesn't need to get involved. If the family can do it, the neighborhood doesn't need to be involved. If the neighbor can do it, the city doesn't need to be involved, and so on and so forth. And it's very much important in terms of human dignity. The Pope says it fosters freedom and participation through the assumption of responsibility. It's also well suited, the Pope argues, in a, in a globalizing society, a world, by promoting governance and authorities at various levels in society today to enhance freedom and to enhance effective results. However, he emphasizes what other recent commentaries have explained. He says subsidiarity must remain closely linked to the principle of solidarity and vice versa, since the former which is subsidiarity, without the latter gives way to social privatism. So the people in the healthcare debate today who are saying, don't affect my insurance, 